Welcome to One Work, Five Questions with Donna Vitek, that is I, <laughs> and Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek, and that is the guy in the blue shirt. <laughs> the best I could do. I don't have a red, white, and blue shirt. I don't have a red one. I do have a white tank top, but that's a little gnarly, I guess. <laughs> For today, yes. Yes, today's a special event. And um, we and I'd like to welcome anyone who joins us on Twitter Spaces today for Thomas Jefferson's original draft of the Declaration of Independence. Woohoo! <laughs> yes, I'm very excited to talk about this today. Um, so, uh, and we have the original Declaration of Independence, the final draft of the Declaration of Independence, what we know today. Um, but uh, to to start off with. Before we get started, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Holacek and tell you some of his credentials. Um, Dr. Holacek is a PhD um, professor of philosophy and history who's taught at institutions such as University of Pittsburgh, University of Michigan, Rutgers University, Camden, Ohio University, and he is the editor of the journal of Thomas Jefferson and his time, and he has published 25, are we at 25 or more now? 25, uh, 25, one on uh, Jefferson and Native Americans should get published pretty soon. That's, I'm finishing a draft, it's really a good book. Okay. I really, really like this book. I, it's it's gonna be a good one. Well, all of them, I, I'm sure. Um, they are, probably... like I always say, my favorite book is my last. It shows you the sort of absorption, you know, that I have in the material, I, I get involved and I get excited when I'm writing. The process of writing is exciting. And and yeah. let's put it bluntly, the process of learning to me, you know, when yeah. I'm writing about Jefferson and the Natives, I there's a lot I didn't know and there's a lot I had to learn and continue to learn on that. So that's what's fun for me. Oh, and um, he also has over 200 essays um, and the list of where you can find his, uh, the list of his books and where you can find his essays will be in the... Um, description of the video. Um, with our show, One Work, Five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson. And today we will discuss the um, original draft of the Declaration of Independence. Yes. And, and, and I add that I'm also a, a white heterosexual male. I know that puts me in vastly in the minority category these days because I don't have so many different sexual preferences, orientations, but so. Uh, so I'm a bit of a dinosaur. Oh, okay. Yes, dinosaur. Did that okay. throw you off completely, well, yeah, right? Thinking, where is he going with this? I don't understand. I, I don't <laughs> always go anywhere. You should know that by now. Come on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, to, so to introduce the topic, Thomas Jefferson's um, Declaration of Independence, and um, I will share again <laughs> the original draft. Um, as one of the most significant political documents in the history of the world. And given today's date, we're giving you a special one work, five questions. Today, we're going to look not at the Declaration of Independence, but Thomas Jefferson's first draft of the document. The document as it was prior to the cosmetic edicts of Franklin and Adams and the heavy edits of Congress. And that's what I can't wait to discuss. <laughs> the heavy edits of Congress. Um, okay, so <laughs> this is one work. Five questions. Okay, are you ready for question number one, Dr. Hall? Yes, so let's do it. Okay, I have too much stuff on my desk here. You, you said one of the most significant, I, I will throw out, uh, I challenge people to find a more significant political document in the history of the world. Um, yeah, I don't think there is. Than, than the Declaration. <laughs> yeah. And I say that because people from all over the world, especially people who have read it and live in oppressive governments, countries with oppressive governments usually know this thing by heart and so forth where we don't, but that's an aside. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Question number one, how did Thomas Jefferson come to be the sole author of the Declaration of Independence? Well, that's um, a big thing. <laughs> yeah, we, we know you, you can put up the, the first slide, the picture okay. you have. Uh, the committee form was Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Roger Sherman, Robert Livingston, and young Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson is uh, 33 years old at the time, right? There's our committee. And uh, John Adams in his uh, autobiography, I think it is, 
what gives the following account. Jefferson will give a different one. Adam says, there are three reasons. I, you know, Adam says he pulled Jefferson aside and tells him he's got to be the principal author. He says, reason first, you're a Virginian and a Virginian ought to appear at the head of this business. Reason second, I am obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular. That's true. You are very much otherwise. Reason third, you can write 10 times better than I can. So, uh, you, you know, Jefferson challenges that, in, you know, basically saying that Adams' opinion, memory uh, is faulty. And he said, Mr. Adams' memory has led him into unquestionable error. The committee of five met, no such thing as a subcommittee was proposed, but they unanimously pressed on myself alone to undertake the draft, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and why is that? Jefferson, of course, you know, did the summary view two years ago when he gained a certain celebrity. We talked about that in a prior one. He's known to be a good writer. And I suspect, you know, even though they had a committee, there's so much going on at the time. You know, the independence was formally declared two days earlier. And uh, no one wants to be on the committee. It's, <laughs> it's really not seen to be an important document. It's sort of like, okay, we already declared independence. Let's just draft a formal document that explains, you know, why we did what we did and let good old Thomas Jefferson do it. No one thought this was going to be an important document. It just, it was sort of after the fact, cover, it's a covering our ass thing. Right, right. right. So Jefferson sits down at 7th and Market Streets and he's got a whole floor to himself. From June 11, you asked me how long did it take? It was from June 11 to June 28th. Okay, when he finishes, he hands his initial copy to, as you can see, Franklin and Adams, the two people who are uh, standing up. Jefferson says in his autobiography, they make sort of verbal alterations. The other two people really did nothing, right? And then it goes to the Continental Congress uh -huh. um, for them to make, and then they do substantial editing. So. Uh, according to the account, um, it was just thrown on his lap because he's a younger member. He's a good writer. Right. And I would add, probably no one else really wanted to do it. Well, it's just like modern day. If we think about the times when we were on committees and groups, it's usually one or two people who do all the work. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. So it's probably good to have someone do the work and then other people can it, uh, revise yeah. it. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, he's probably it's probably thrown, thrown on him because it's not seen as an important document. Let the young guy do it. He's a good writer. All right. All right. It made sense. Um, OK, question number two. What is the main argument in the Declaration of Independence? And is that argument sustained after heavy edits of the Continental Congress? Loaded question. We're going to take some time on this. Now you've put up, you've arranged five different slides here. Yes. We can start with the first one and let our viewers and listeners follow in. He says, okay. when the, this is Jefferson's initial salvo, his, okay. his opening shot, he says, when the course of human events becomes necessary for people to, a people to advance that, of, from that subordination in which they have hitherto remained, and to assume among the powers of the earth equal and independent station uh, to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them, a decent respect for the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the change. Now, notice he says uh, this is substantially the same as in the final draft, the opinions of mankind. So it's not just you know, it's covering our ass, but it's also, he's appealing to the whole world. Right. The opinions of mankind, ought they ought to hear why we're doing this, because as I've mentioned before, it's a strange sort of revolution, because even though they were taxed in all sorts of duties and things and uh, for which they had no uh, say, um, you know, they weren't being, you know, burped. They weren't being completely suffocated. Uh, but it really was a rebellion, a revolution fought from um, the sake of freedom for liberty. And we can go to that. So that's the first paragraph. Let's go to the second one. This one is a, you know, this is probably the most famous one. Next slide. This is Thomas Jefferson's draft. We hold these truths to be sake. The that's, right, that are emboldened, are emboldened by me. Now, notice he's got 
these truths to be sacred and undeniable, that all men are created equal and independent. You notice we have a comma instead of a semicolon. Before every other that, there's a semicolon. So there's a grammatical infelicity, Thomas. Put your semicolon there. That from that equal creation, they derive rights inherent and inalienable among which are the preservation of life and liberty and pursuit of happiness. John Locke talks about pursuit of property. So there is a moral dimension here. We have a right to life, our own liberty to live our own way, and the pursuit of happiness, namely government can't do that. I'll say more about this. To secure these ends, governments are instituted, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So here's a big shift. Government is instituted to preserve these fundamental rights. Because we're equal and independent, government must secure our preservation of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, right? Because they derive their powers from the consent of the people. Finally, when every form of government shall become destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. So we have an additional right, the right to revolution, right? Uh, and to institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles, in organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Now that suggests a lot of people say Jefferson's a political relativist, that what makes you know people in one group happy is going to be different. I don't think that that's the case in the least. Uh, basically, he's deciding, he's saying that the people have a right to institute any form of government that they want, but of course they're not going to institute a brutal, oppressive, coercive government. Right. And he thinks that they're going to institute a sort of government that uh, is virtuous, is knowledgeable and includes the consent of the people. Now, we have, uh, you know, I say something in my forthcoming book on the disease of liberty, which will be coming out later this year, about how Jefferson talks about the equal, uh, all men are equal and independent. And then he says, from that equal creation, they deserve rights. This is not in the final draft. And this is something noticed by no one else. Okay. Jefferson talks about we are created equal and independent. He's not using liberty here or free. From that equal creation, liberty is a derivative right. So how are we born free in the sense of having liberty? He uses independence and liberty. Very important to note the distinction that we're born equal and independent. Because of our equality, we deserve liberty. Right. Now, I think he has in mind here that independence is something different from liberty. We are in the state of nature independent. We can do whatever we want, but we're not, we don't have liberty. Right. Liberty is a social construction only happens when you live in a society of human beings. And that is a sort of a, a, a contract, as it were, between all people to respect the rights of all other people, allow them to live as they want. Now, so, so if I'm right, this shows that how do we deserve liberty? We deserve it from equality, hmm. right? And I'll leave that as is. go on to the next slide. Um, I'm not going to read this through, um, but I'll give in just what's going on here. He says, look, people are disinclined to overthrow a government for light and intransient, light and transient causes. So uh, it, he says mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable. So in other words, while abuses are sufferable, people will suffer and they probably should. Right. Because to attempt a revolution where a lot of people are going to die in the process to change a government, you really need to be sure that the revolution is right headed. So this is a very important thing here. Uh, so he says, look, under what conditions is it appropriate to overthrow a government when a government's been abusive in the same manner over a long period of time? There can be no question, right, that the it's an abusive government, right? It's an authoritarian government in which case you have a right, right? You have appeal to all people everywhere to show you why we're, um, why we're overthrowing the government. Okay, that's all I wanna say on that, but I mean, it's an important sort of qualification here, right? 
<clears throat> and then um, leave this one, like go, go to the summary, leave this one, we'll get to this one later for if you have a different question. Okay, so the argument in summation is this. Looking at it, there's a threaded argument. All people are created equal. When I have the brackets, that means it's implicit. If he's not stating this, people are social animals. In other words, liberty in the social setting. Conclusion from one and two, so all people are endowed with certain rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness to enable them to live peaceably among each other in a social setting. Another premise that goes with three, governmental power is derived from the consent of the people. Those, this goes away from uh, Hobbes and other people, you know, believe in a monarchy. Uh, the king is the chosen, is chosen by God. The consent of the people have nothing to do with government. Six, when any government fails to secure its citizens' rights, the citizens have a right to abolish it. George III has abusively violated the British colonists' rights. Jefferson lists 20 plus grievances. I think there are like 18 listed, but in those 18 complaints against the king, some of them are complex. In other words, they're conjunctive, they're and claims. There's more than one claim, right, listed there. So he gives these 20 plus grievances. Notice this is a very good inductive argument. I, I just don't have one thing. I'm gonna show a consistent right. strain of abuses throughout. Right. The colonists have a right to form all, their own government in keeping with their own notions of what government should be and overthrow the government. Right. So it's a, a textured argument. And it's, you know, unlike <laughs> the way people write today, it's it's brilliantly articulated. Mm -hmm. right? it, it's, it's very plainly and thoroughly argued. And the grievances against the king are critical to show that these abuses, as he says, are consistent, long, and not going to change. Right. All right. That's so much for question two. Okay. Are you ready for question three? <laughs> I guess so. Okay. Given the heavy edits of Congress, can Thomas Jefferson be rightfully said to have authored the document? Many have claimed that he is not the author. Yeah, here we're going to have a little fun because <laughs> we get into some of the stupidity in the secondary literature, and I don't know how else to call it. Um it's commonly claimed by the calumniators, by the Jefferson haters, that uh, that Jefferson's not the author. I'll give you two examples, two of my favorite. One is Pauline Meyer in her book, American Scripture, talking about the Declaration. She says, people think of Jefferson as a Moses getting the Ten Commandments from God. He was part of a five-man committee which oversaw the project. I already showed you that two of the members of the committee did nothing. Franklin and Adams made... Jefferson says cosmetic alterations. They altered very, very little, probably cleaning up grammar and things like that. Right. Um, so, you know, he's part of five-man committee. What, what Meyer doesn't tell you, well, what did the other four people do? Nothing. He says, she says it was an active group editing. And then she says, we need not look at it as a sacred text, right? And it is a sacred text. What? I, I said, this is... In my estimation, the most important political document that's ever been crafted by human beings. And she sums, this is my favorite, Jefferson was the most overrated person in American history. Okay. How the hell do you drive that conclusion? Talk about illogicity. Wow. So Meyer, of course, she's passed away now. She studied every person in American history, made a thorough study to, sh to know that Jefferson is somehow the most overrated. Of all the people that have ever existed in this country, she studied them all, and she can say definitively, Jefferson's the most overrated person. This is a quote. Another one, which is not so bad, is Danielle Allen. She writes a, a, a nice book on a, called Our Declaration. It's a reading. And her argument is, uh, I find it kind of, Meyer's argument is just ridiculous. She, you can just tell she's out to destroy Jefferson. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. She's she's not nice. She's being nasty. She's trying to she's trying to sell books. Right. That's how you sell books. She's trying to destroy uh, the great. If the, if it's not a great document, right? If she can show that, then we're getting excited over nothing. Right. Well, her book is not a very good book. Anyway, Daniel Allen says, well, the only thing we can claim is Jefferson began the project. Uh -huh. There were four other members on the committee, right? They reviewed the document. 
There were 51 other members in the Congress who contributed. They did make substantial and heavy edits. They didn't change the tenor of the argument in the least. Uh -huh. What they did is cut things out and made some suggestions for clarity of expression, right. in which cases, in most cases, their edits were appropriate. Jefferson was being vague or uh, equivocal, when, and the edits were good, except for we'll get to the, the one you know we're going to talk about. Yeah. Then she goes, then there was, so we have the four of the members committee, the other members of Congress saw it, so they contributed to it. Then there was the clerk, Matt Lack, he says, who textured the text with his form of calligraphy because he used a calligraphy, so he's a creator of it. Okay. Uh, and then she goes, there were the words and voices of all those people who participated in conversation with Jefferson, Adams, Lee, and Mason. So the idea is because Jefferson came in contact with other people and probably discussed, you know, political issues, you know, for a long time, we can't say that the document that he wrote was written by him. Now, I'm writing a book on Jefferson and Native Americans. Uh, the book before publication, of course, I had to do a lot of reading. I drew from a lot of other sources to learn. So you want to say Holacek really didn't write the book because he had to read other people, right? And then I take it to the editors that accept that they make edits because the, the, the writing needs to be better, or I might make a mistake, so I have to correct it. So by the time the book gets published, and then there are all the other people all throughout my life to whom I talked that influenced me, you know, in my in the way I write and think. Right. So basically, the book that I'm going to publish on on Jefferson and Native Americans is not my book. It belongs to everybody. Everybody in the world wrote it. Right? <laughs> everybody with whom I converse. It's just a silly, silly argument, right? <laughs> Uh, she says, she sums the, well, all we can say about Jefferson is that, um, is that he created a first draft. No, he didn't. He created a document that survived heavy edits that did not substantially change the, the, the thread of the argument in the least. Right. There's one passage that they cut out that pissed Jefferson off. We'll talk about that. I know you want to ask that. You told me <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting patiently for that question. <laughs> Jefferson writes in 1776, if any doubt has arisen as to me, my country will have my political, my political creed in the form of a declaration. He says it's my political creed, uh, which I was lately directed to draw. This will give decisive proof that my own sentiment concurred with the vote they instructed us to give. Jefferson himself says it's my document. Now, it's my document, which agrees to the sentiment of other people. But he says, this is my political creed. He admits to it. Jefferson, let's stop it right here. Jefferson wrote the fucking declaration. End of story. <laughs> well, I'll make sure to rate this not for kids. <laughs> okay. I get upset about that because I, to me, literally, it's people posturing for publicity. Right. Instead of being honest about the thing, let's just, you know, we can't do that today. We got to make outrageous claims. He's the most overrated person in history because that's going to sell books. I, you know, I, I can't do that. I'm sorry. I can't do that. I'm convinced historians do that to draw attention to themselves where it would not right. otherwise well, I'm be. a more significant figure than mm -hmm. Thomas. You know what, Holacek? I'm not. <laughs> right? I'm not. Okay, I might so be suitable for polishing his boots. That's about it. Let's get to question number four. There was one particular edit of the Continental Congress that angered Thomas Jefferson. Can you tell us about that? Well, you can put up the slide. The one we passed okay. over. Okay. You know which one that is. And um, those of you on Twitter spaces, I will post the video of this discussion in the comments when I repost this, um, when I repost this, uh, we need to get Show. the slide. Oh, uh oh, I I don't think I I that I don't have. I don't know which slide you which slide do you want. The one note, the text, the fifth one with the text. Oh, the this was the fifth one. The fourth one. Right. Oh, there. okay. This one. This is the okay. Uh, the most, out of all the grievances Jefferson lists, this came last. This was more than twice as long, much more than twice as long as the next lengthy grievance, 
And notice in psychological terms what he does. Um, uh, recency and primacy are two psychological effects in, in, we know from psychology today that if you want to get someone's attention, for example, I'm going to a job interview and I really want to maximize my chance to get a job. So where do I want to be if there are 25 people? I want to be the first or the last. Right. Jefferson puts this last. That's how you get attention. People remember the last one. They remember the first one. Right. Right. <clears throat> Much more. So let's read through this carefully. He's talking about the king. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people, blacks, who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, the new world, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. That was probably one of the worst things about slavery, if not the worst, was the transportation. I've written on that. It was very barbaric. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel, the bold as Jefferson's powers, is the warfare of the Christian king. Jefferson's uh, Jefferson's uh, um, a lettering here. King of Great Britain determined to keep open a market where men, capital M-E-N, should be bought and sold. Right now, he's calling these slaves men. Mm -hmm. If you're talking, a lot of people say he didn't mean the declaration to apply to black people. Bullshit. He's uh -huh. calling them men. And what does he say earlier? All men are created equal. Right. That applies to all people. Right. Yeah. Right. So this is clear. A lot of people don't eat. A lot of scholars would say, well, the declaration doesn't apply to blacks. Uh -huh. Read what he wrote that was cut out. He says clearly they are. Follow the syllogism. Right. All people, all men are created equal, deserving rights, life, liberty, pursuit, happiness. Slaves here, black people are men. He says he's prostituted as negative, basically saying that the king had the opportunity, even though he didn't initiate uh, the slave trade, the opportunity to negate it through his veto and never chose to do so. Right. Okay, so this, without reading the whole thing through, is a very important passage neglected conveniently by a lot of people who want to paint Jefferson a racist, where Jefferson says, look, this is just horrible. Uh, and it ought, slavery ought to be obliterated. Now, why was this deleted? Were the members of the Continental Congress complete racist? No, it, it's just, look, we're in the middle of a war with Britain. We've declared independence. Now, the southern states have slaves, and they're not going to like what they read here. Basically, it's saying we have to, they need to get rid of their slaves. And much money is invested in uh, the slaves in the South. And so the blacks, uh, the, the uh, southerners weren't too happy with this clause, and they wanted it omitted. And the members of the Congress, rightfully so at the time, omitted it. And uh -huh. the reason being, there's another day to write, there's an urgency to getting the declaration published and, and done and, and uh, voted on. Uh, let's get this thing done and agreed on. So the Congress omitted, and I think clearly was the right decision at the time. Let's okay. fight this battle at another day. All right. So this is a very, very important passage. Right. Uh, well, also, too, um, they. I, I'm just trying to think how it would have been back then. Um, you're trying, you're fighting a revolution against Great Britain. How did they know that if they did release the slaves, the slave wouldn't fight for Britain? Um, and they did. And, and, and then we was would not urging, urging slaves to revolt and fight. Just like right. Britain was urging Native Americans to fight, and many Native Americans fought against, were enticed because they realized that the the white uh, frontiersmen kept moving into their land uninvited, you know. Right. So why wouldn't they fight? Right. So right. there was this perpetual problem of trying to keep the Native Americans from fighting with the British and trying to keep slaves from uprising and fighting with the British. Uh, there are stories about the British maltreatment of blacks too, um, in plague and so forth, how one of the British generals left a whole boatload of black people to die from a disease and didn't care for them. 
that's a different story. Right. We may have to, that may, that's an, an idea for another episode. Okay. Question number five, we're running out of time. We only have eight minutes left. Um, yeah, question five. Plenty of time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Eight last, there was a, last, there was a great controversy in his day and in ours that Thomas Jefferson plagiarized. Can you tell us about that? Probably wasn't such a big crime in his day as it is ours, but, um, you know, Locke said life, liberty, pursuit of property, right. and George Mason, you know, the people were saying that he stole from George Mason, Locke, Aristotle, and Jefferson addressed that twice in 1825, and the notion, one, one is to James Meese, September 26th, he says, the sacred attachments of our fellow citizens to the event of which the paper of July 4, 1776 was but a declaration, The genuine effusion of the soul of the country at the time. Small things may perhaps like the relics of saint, saints help to nourish our devotion to this holy bond of the union and keep it longer alive. So he's talking about the document becoming a holy relic in some sense. It has become a tremendously important document. It wasn't at the time and no one ever thought it would be. They were astonished to find years later that it become such an important. Now the one letter that you asked me to include, which I was going to include anyway, is the one to Henry Lee in Jefferson says, look, this document was never uh, meant to be unique. Right. Certainly I drew from, he says, uh, not to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of, not merely to say things which had never before said, but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject in terms so plain and firm as to command their assent and to justify ourselves in the, appended, in the independent stand we are compelled to take. Neither aiming at originality of principle or sentiment, nor yet copied from any particular or previous writing. He says he didn't have any writing from which he was drawing particular. It was intended to be an expression of the American mind and to give that expression the proper tone and spirit called for by the occasion. All, right. All its authority rests then on the harmonizing sentiments of the day, whether expressed in conversation, letters, printed essays, or in the elementary books of public right, as Aristotle, Cicero, your buddy right now, Locke, <laughs> Sidney, etc. Right? So he's, if the wording sounds a lot like John Locke, it's not because everybody knew John Locke by heart. They knew George, you know, George Mason's works by heart. And so there was a lot of commonality in the sentiments expressed, right? right? Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness or property and things like that. He's saying here, in copy from anything, but all these things, all these ideas were in the air and everybody knew them, right? So the idea is I'm just trying to take everything that was in the air, express it in a manner that is a, a proper tone and spirit called for by the occasion its merit, he says in the final sentence, is whether or not it conforms to the sentimizing, to the harmonizing sentiments of the day. The fact that today we still read the document and it's still so compelling is evidence that Jefferson did an enormously uh, a great job at, you know, affecting a harmony of sentiments in writing the document. Right. Well, aren't we all a collection of everything we read? I mean, some t somebody could say that I'm copying you and some of the things I write because I'm learning from you. I'm. But you also select. You you can right. learn from me. You take things that you like. You take things you don't like, and you reject them. Right. Uh, you, there's a selection going on here. You're your own person. Right. And Jefferson is is saying I wasn't trying. He says this was my own document. He says in 1776, but he's also expressing his own views in a way that yeah. harmonizes with the general it's the general voice of people around the world who believe that government should be of and by the people that's a powerful thing that this is the this is the skeleton of a political philosophy he's going to develop years later mm -hmm. this is this argument right to revolution right for people to govern and not be governed by their king it's a very powerful thing, and I still resonates with people today. Yes. Don't you think? Yes, I, I do believe so. <laughs> That's why we're here today. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Holacek. This has been so enjoyable. And, and we've um, got a lot of time, so you can, you can bring this puppy home. 
Yeah, yeah. Great so home for adoption. <laughs> let's see, what do we have here? Let me share the screen again. And um I I I like this picture so much. Um of the John Trumbull's it was a miniature done by John Trumbull, um, who met Jefferson in England and later in Paris. Uh, Jefferson invited Trumbull to come stay with him in Paris while he was minister plenipotentiary. And he convinces Trumbull to be the painter of the American Revolution. Trumbull paints, you love the American Revolution, look up Trumbull's works of art. And just about all the people in this painting, uh, he drew uh, from personal likeness. He detested trying to just make up a face for a figure. He wanted right. figures to be likenesses. So he drew Adams from likeness. He drew Jefferson. Jefferson looks pretty old there, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> so all the miniatures, there are like three or four miniatures Jefferson does of Jefferson. They're all derived from this portrait here, which he makes into a large picture many, yeah. many decades later. He has this enormous picture. Well, so the next episode um, that we'll do, um, it'll be Thomas Jefferson's letter to George Wythe, dated the 13th of August, 1786. Um, and it's on education and republicanism. Uh, so this is, I, I can't wait. Every every episode is, excites me as much yeah, as this, the last. Yeah, this is another, another <laughs> political uh, letter. Uh, I choose this because Wythe was uh, one of his three heroes in life. Uh, Peyton Randolph and uh, William Small was his professor hero. He talks of them as his three uh, sinosures, his three heroes. With was a, a lawyer uh, and an older friend of profoundly good integrity. He worshipped George With, and he oh, studied. Wait, okay, I was pronouncing it White. <laughs> a lot of people do it. I think that's the way you'd pronounce it if you just looked at it. Yeah, um, yeah. I was corrected too when I started Jefferson. So I said White. <laughs> They said it's with, with okay, like, <laughs> yeah. But okay. uh, the idea here, and this will be in conjunction with my book, book on Jefferson education, okay, is that um, Jeffersonian republicanism requires an educated citizenry, and it requires an educated uh, uh, rulers, uh, educated rulers in some sense but it also requires morally sensitive rulers as well. The notion that I've argued in a number of places, education for Jefferson goes hand in glove with his political philosophy. If you don't have education, you can't have government of and by the people. So right. I don't know if that's a bunch of a teaser, but- Or, well, or you end up with maybe what we have today. <laughs> um, if, yeah, when the... yeah you, you have to. And then you have to have Along with education, you also have to have uh, a willingness to participate, right? You, you have to, there are sacrifices. You can't just say, well, you know, I, I, I want to be able to vote and stuff. You have to make sacrifice. You have to participate. Right. Failure to participate means Jeffersonian 